Our brains are designed to take in information and adapt quickly. And whether they're educated or not, or just cunning, abusers have figured that out. And they will use what they know to take advantage of you. Hey guys, welcome back to the First Hustle Then Brunch podcast. Today's episode is coming to you a little bit delayed. Normally we release new episodes on Mondays, but given the terrorist attacks that occurred in Israel over the weekend, I definitely wanted to wait just to be respectful. We have listeners from all over the world, from all different backgrounds, and I just want to send so much love and support to anyone that has been affected by the conflict that is happening. And I just want you to know that we see you and we're here to support you. That being said, we do have a really good episode today that is also part of our Domestic Violence Awareness Month series. So I am speaking with Dr. Dina McMillan. She's a social psychologist and international published author, public speaker, and content creator. She is best known for her groundbreaking program for domestic abuse and violence prevention called Unmasking the Abuser, and she also has a podcast of the same name. In this episode, she's teaching us how we can spot an abuser before we ever get in a committed relationship with them. So I think this is super helpful, especially for domestic abuse survivors. Now, we actually had a ton of tech issues (laughs) while we were recording this episode, and it ended up taking us several hours. We were talking, I lost power in the middle of the interview. So regardless of the mishaps that tried to stop this message from getting out, we definitely felt that it was important and we pushed through and I'm so glad to share with you today. So let's go ahead and just dive in. Hi, Dr. McMillan. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. I'm honored to have you. I came across you back in April, found your podcast. I read your book and everything was so, so helpful. I felt like you were just... In my personal situation, like everything I was reading and hearing, I just kept being like, yep, that happened, that happened, that happened. I could relate to it so much. So I'm really glad to have you on. And I know what we're going to talk about is going to help so many people. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. So can you start out by telling us a little bit about how you got involved in this space, a little bit about your research and how you kind of discovered domestic violence and how it can be prevented? Well, I should start off by saying that I'm sort of an unusual person to be in the domestic violence space. Most people who go into domestic violence are clinical psychologists and social workers. Um, I'm a social psychologist, and I need to briefly explain what that is. Social psychology is the study of interaction, and it's the study of power dynamics. So what we look at is how people are influenced and persuaded and manipulated and coerced and indoctrinated and brainwashed. So we look at all of those things and we actually study how to influence somebody, how to persuade them, how to change their beliefs and behaviors, and especially how to do that so that they don't realize that an external force is actually the one causing the change. So they internalize it and think, oh, I just changed my mind, or I really like that political candidate, or I really like that product, I've got to get that. And they think it was themselves that changed their minds, and it was somebody like me behind the curtain. Using what we know about the brain, about social interaction, about how we influence each other, somebody has been behind the curtain pulling the strings. Mm. So I worked in that field. I graduated from Stanford, and I I moved to Los Angeles, and flash forward perhaps a year and a half, I'm working in various things, and then someone comes to me, a close friend of my daughter's mom, Um, came to me and said, I have a really close friend in a domestic violence situation. Do you know anything about that? Well, because domestic abuse is about a power dynamic and a power imbalance, I did know something. So I helped how I could, 
And then I went back and got specific training in domestic abuse. And I continued to work in that field. But the problem I had is that I was dealing with people who were already in that field. You would know this and your audience would know this. When you walk into a field of study or, or a, a profession, you look to the people who are already established to understand how it's done what factors to take into consideration, where you need to put your effort, how to succeed according to their rules. I did that for almost nine years and I was ready to quit because I felt what we were doing was, was so ineffective. We were coming in too late and it was too superficial. I got mm -hmm. fed up and then I said, I'm going to quit. I went out for a walk and the universe had a different idea. I felt actually heard in my head, it said, you're doing it wrong. And I'm looking around saying, who is that? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all my social psychology, it was like it smacked together with all of my research, with all of my, you know, out in the field experience. And it started reinterpreting everything I was seeing from a social psychologist lens. And I realized that by taking social psychology and, and bringing it over to domestic abuse, that I could actually teach people what the manipulation tactics used by abusers look like, what they feel like, and why they're so powerful. I could also show people how to shield yourself from them. So that's what I did. And that's when I wrote but he says he loves me, the book that you, that you read. Mm -hmm. And I put together a program at the same time called Unmasking the Abuser. And that's the premise for my, my podcast of the same name. So if you look up Dr. Dina McMillan, Unmasking the Abuser, you'll see first my TED talk where I discuss how this happened and start talking about what you need to know to keep yourself safe. But you'll also find my podcast where I take all the information from my education program and I provide it in detail for free on my podcast. Yeah, and it's so helpful. How many episodes do you have? I know there's over 20. It's I uh, 27 time. now, 28. Yeah, so what we'll talk about in this episode is just a tiny snippet of the, the tips that you have um, provided in the podcast? Well, the podcasts are usually pretty short and they're definitely worth mm -hmm. your time. And one thing I cannot emphasize more strongly to everyone listening to this, everyone watching this, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care what kind of healthy family you grew up in or how well you're able to discern warning signs in your friends' relationships. If you don't know how to protect yourself against these guys, there's a whole category of women that I discuss in my seminars and workshops, and I talk about it in my work, called The mm -hmm. Challenge. Some of these guys have told me, because I've interviewed, now I've interviewed over 700 abusers of all nationalities, all races, all backgrounds. And because it was confidential, they were very honest with me. And they told me point blank, some of them really like transforming a woman who thinks she's confident and has it all together into someone that they totally control. Yeah, that's crazy. I know my audience is made up of mostly entrepreneurs or women who are kind of dipping their toes, getting their feet wet in the online space. Um, and a lot of them are also well-educated and have college degrees and backgrounds. So I think this is definitely important because I know, especially for myself, I never thought that I would be in, a, in an abusive relationship. It, it didn't even phase me as a possibility. It wasn't that I thought I was, you know, invincible or that it could never happen to me. It just didn't even occur to me that it could happen. So yeah, I'm so glad that you're doing this work. I think it's super important. And I think that's something that sets you apart because 
there's a lot of information about what domestic violence is and maybe what to do if it happens to you, but there's not enough information about how to prevent it, what signs to look out for, and that sort of thing. So that's one of the reasons why I definitely had to bring you on for this series. Well, one of the things, two things, first of all, my work is different, and this isn't a brag, this is no brag, just fact. My work is different because if you look right now, there's a, there are a huge number of books out and podcasts on bad men talking about narcissists. You know, narcissism is the, is the new buzzword. And they mm-hmm. go in depth, the depth about these guys. My work differs because I don't just talk about the guys and give you key insights. Some of it, not just from someone else's research, but from my own and straight from the horse's mouth. Because these sessions were confidential and they knew what they told me had to, I had to take to my grave, they were a lot more frank with me than they usually are when they're dealing with somebody who has to sign off on something or who can punish them in some way. So getting insights into these guys is great, but I'm the only one that I know of that actually talks about you. So it's great to know what these guys are up to, but you need to understand what's going on in your own heart and mind that can make you vulnerable and Mm -hmm. how you shield yourself from that so that you can stay safe. And I want to tell you, Jazzy, unfortunately, if you've ever been with an abuser, and we're talking emotional abuse, it doesn't have to get physical. If you've ever been with one, that's a permanent scar. That's a permanent vulnerability. So it is really crucial for you to learn the warning signs and have them and have training and tactics in your mind and a determination to act on them if you see them. Believe me, I will not make you paranoid. I don't believe all men are abusive. I know wonderful men. I want you to be with one of those because regardless of what you want to do with your life, you get with one of these guys, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So in interviewing with, you know, you said over 700 men that were abusers, did you identify any characteristics or features of them that were all pretty similar that stand out as, you know, things that people can look out for with abusers? Well, one of the problems is there are different types. And most of the literature boils it down to three types, and they vary by name, but here are the basic three types. The, the base, first type is the, is the obvious abuser. They call him the under-controlled abuser. So he's the kind of guy that loses his temper easily. He, he's mean, and often he, it shows on his face. If he's over the age of, let's say, 25, it begins to show in just how he carries himself. So he's the one that walks around with a scowl. He makes really cutting comments about other people. You can tell first, second time you have a meal or spend time with this guy that he is really mean. You don't necessarily Mm. need my help with this one. He's shown you who he is. He's not hiding. The other two types can be a bit more subtle. The second type and I'm, I'm talking about Donald G. Dutton's work on abusers. He, he put the name to these. There are other people that have different names, but the same types, really. Um, mm-hmm. the, un, the over-controlled abuser is the second type. And the over-controlled abuser is usually very financially successful. He's very detail-oriented. He may be a bit OCD. You know, he's got obsessive compulsive disorder about some things. He's really strict about how things are done, very detail-oriented. If you get involved with him, he also tends to be quite cold emotionally. He tends to be stingy, and he is hyper-detailed. So if you get involved with an over-controlled abuser, he will lock you in quickly. He will quickly do everything he can to close off any viable exits, making it really hard for you to leave him. Now, the third type is, I I call this the charming abuser. This is the one I talk about most 
because he's the sneakiest type. And this is the kind of guy that is often charming and personable. And a lot of the tactics that we talk about, like the love bombing, where they give you all of these compliments and make all these promises and and immediately start talking about all the fun things that you'll do in the future and what a great life mm -hmm. you'll have together. That's the third type. And that's the one you really need to be careful of because this type will come in and sweep you off your feet if you're not careful. And as soon as he has you committed to that relationship, the mask will drop and you'll realize what a terrible relationship you've gotten into with a hyper-controlling, mm -hmm. extremely selfish, moody man who will brutalize you emotionally and psychologically, if not also physically, whenever he's in a bad mood and that can be caused by anything. Yeah. I guess this is another common misconception is that there's a specific type of a person that becomes an abuser. You know, you hear about abusers and they say, oh, I would never believe that, that he's an abuser. You know, I can't, I can't believe that he's not the type. And I feel like, you know, in my experience, at least I've learned, you just never know. <laughs> well, also too, um, I would say more than 85% of the abusers I interviewed came from a family where they were uh, severely neglected where their mother was in an abusive relationship or more than one relationship or a combination of the two because one of the things people need to be aware of when a woman is involved with an abuser one of the, regardless of he's if, if he's type one two or three that i just mentioned they are extraordinarily je jealous pathologically jealous they want all of their partner's time love and attention and that includes being jealous of their children. So if you're involved with an abuser, you, he will force you to emotionally neglect your children in favor of him. So those children mm -hmm. grow up with abandonment complexes due to the emotional neglect they grew up with, even if their mother was loving and would have been wonderful with a different man. These guys right. will not allow it. She will be harshly punished if she defies him. So she usually mm -hmm. gives in and will neglect her kids. And a, a brief example, one woman that I was talking to, she came to me because she was looking for an intervention order. She wanted to get away from her husband. She had a six-month-old son. And she said that her husband would tell her, now her son was still breastfed, if her son cried because he was hungry, or because he was distressed, her husband would say, he needs to man up. And he would not allow wow. her to go to the child and she'd be sitting there. And I don't, I know you have some moms there. You know how you oh, yeah. start leaking when it's time to feed the baby? Yeah. She'd be mm -hmm. sitting there leaking milk in distress because it starts to hurt if you don't feed them. Yeah. But mm -hmm. he would not allow her to go because he wanted her to pay attention to him. And I've lost count of the stories I've heard like this. So as you can imagine, when that little boy grows up, he's going to have an abandonment complex. And if he's not careful, that will cause the replication of the same pattern that caused him to be so distressed. Wow. Yeah, that hits home for sure. My ex actually told me that he was afraid that I would let my daughter love me too much. And this was, she wasn't even born yet and he was telling me this. They're jealous of everybody, even their own children. Wow. So that shows up in all three types. So the, the three types have, once you get below the, you know, beyond the superficial, the three types have mm -hmm. a lot more in common than one might think, but it is worthwhile knowing the different types because there's a book called the, the Abusive Personality that talks about this, or I talk about it in my work, the different types of abusers. You need to know the different types because they wear slightly different disguises when you first meet them. And as I said, the, mm -hmm. the least disguised 
is the under controlled abuser that's always angry and has, you know, is angry at the world and it is hyper nasty and mean. But you don't need mm -hmm. me. If you are attracted to that type, you need therapy, you need to go now. You need to stay away from all men until you get rid of that. The other two types can fool healthy women. And that's mm -hmm. where I come in. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the characteristics that abusers look for in the people that they target? I was actually paid by a police force, a national police force here in Australia to put together a short little research reference. It's only 20 pages. It has photos, but it lists the selection process of abusers, what we're about to talk about now. And it actually lists a basic definition of the tactics. Okay, there are less than 25 tactics in total. And I, I list them all and describe what they're like. The selection process is important because there are basically three types of women and abusers have a preference for one type or another. Type one is already primed. This is an already trained woman. She comes from a, a very traditional background or a farming community or somewhere where there were very strict sex roles and the male was in charge and there was no quibble about that. The second type is the advantage. A lot of women want the pretty woman experience. They want to get with Elon Musk, okay? Um, <laughs> they have no money, no education, but they want to get with a guy that's like super wealthy, jet setter, super successful. Well, guess what? If you get with a guy like that, if you're with a guy like that, since he's bringing everything about your lifestyle, he gets to make all the rules. So it lends itself to an emotionally, psychologically, and financially abusive relationship. So that's type two, a guy who looks for an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, even if he doesn't have huge advantages, I talk about what he'll do to broaden the gap between you to widen the advantage the advantages at least in your own mind again so he can gain complete control over your life and your lives together the third type is the challenge and one of the things i i will send you in that document is a list of tricks used by abusers who like the challenge in order to get someone who's smart and savvy and has it together, in order to get a woman like that to get involved with him. And one of the, I'll give you a couple of examples. One of my favorites is Harry Helpful. This is the guy that comes along because you're overwhelmed and he is always there to help you with something. You start talking to him because he's, he'll do this for you, he'll do that for you. But he's using that as a trick to get into your life. Um, and another variation on that is when he becomes your, your, your staunchest ally. Um, he becomes the person you go to with problems and he, always, he tells you all the time, oh, you are so right. They don't appreciate you. So these can seem like good things. They are actually warning signs. And I will list the ones that, that are there that I've seen over and over again. Realize I have interviewed in depth more than 5,000 victims and survivors from across the world. I work across the world. I don't just work in the United States. I work in, mm -hmm. the, in the UK, in England, Scotland, Ireland. I work in New Zealand. I live in Australia. I work here. I, live, I work in Canada. I have, I have people, because I have a book, my book, but he says he loves me, is printed in Spanish. I have people contacting me, and I've done work with people throughout the Spanish-speaking world, including Spain, and the English-speaking world, including places like the Philippines and South Africa. So I'm not just talking about one race, one group, one mm -hmm. nationality. The good news is... They all use the same tactics. The bad news is 
They use those tactics because if you're, uh, you're not guarded, if you don't shield yourself, they are very effective. These tactics are used because they're successful. Unless, mm -hmm. unless you're smart enough to spot them, see them for the warning signs that they are, and quickly work to get away from that person. Wow. Yeah, I guess so. What are some of those tactics and strategies that they use, especially at the beginning of a relationship? Because we talk about prevention. So what are some of the strategies that they use to, to trap women? And then how do those tactics evolve as the relationship goes on? You know, often when you do media, they'll take a program like mine that took years to put together and they'll say, well, give us one hint in one sentence. What would you say the woman should look out for? <laughs> well, let's, yeah. let's start at the beginning. They all start mm -hmm. with a single tactic that I call testing and training. And it's actually two parts. Testing is that they will do things. They will push up against your boundaries to see how you react. One of the simplest ways, let's, let's, this is described so many people. You arrange to meet this guy for coffee because you have listened to Dr. Dina and you know the first time you get together with somebody should probably be in the daytime. Remove all sexual expectations. Meet him in the daytime. Meet him somewhere public. So you arrange to meet for coffee on, on Saturday or you meet for brunch on Sunday at 11 a.m. You get there a little early because you don't want to be late. You want to see if there's a line. You get there 10 to 11. He texts you and says, oh, my God, emergency. My car's not working. My boss called me. He has some valid excuse. I'm going to be a few minutes late. Is that OK? And you want him to like you. So you're like, oh, sure, that's fine. Ten minutes after 11, he texts you. Goodness, this was more complicated than I thought. I'm getting ready. I'm on my way now. Use text back. Okay, I found a place to sit. He walks in 30, 45 minutes later. He, you've just passed your first test. You didn't leave. Mm. You were nice about it. You let him waste your time. You made sure you had everything in place to be there on time. And he was able to push against that. And you stayed. Then he gets there and you have a seat and he's like, oh, this is really noisy. Let me see if I can get us a better place. So he'll try to move you somewhere else to see if you'll go. Mm. You're trying to be nice. You don't want to come off angry, bitchy, right. demanding. Mm -hmm. So you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> so he physically moves you somewhere else. And social psychologists will tell you the importance of somebody getting you to actually move somewhere. It is, if you study cults, one of the things they'll do is get you to move around the room. Physically moving you is an important tactic. So then you get there, you're ordering food. He'll say, you know, this is one of my favorite places. They have a dish that I love. Will you want to try it? Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay. Now, it doesn't matter the specifics. What matters is if you look back on this date, you realized that there are several situations where he changed the rules at the last minute or asked you to make a compromise and you did it. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the danger in that? The danger in that is that your brain is listening and watching what you're doing the subconscious part of your brain, the part that chooses your partner. And if you allow this guy to move you around like a chess piece, your brain has put him in a category called authority over me. <laughs> so pretty soon he'll be able to tell you to do things and you'll obey him and you'll ask yourself later, when did he become the boss of me? Yeah. Well, he started really early. Mm -hmm. And if he's the third type of abuser, 
He's probably charming. So he'll make it sound like he's being easygoing, charming, accommodating. He'll smile. Oh, you have to taste this dish. And he's got this gorgeous smile. He flashes at you. He's totally hot. And he <laughs> knows it. So you keep accommodating him. And he becomes an authority in your own mind. Wow. And that is the test. He's testing you. But at the same time, by moving you around, he's training you. So also included with this, he will ask you questions that are too intimate for someone who's still a stranger to see if he can get you to tell him. If you give in to him, every time you give in to him, he will give you a reward of some kind, whether it's long approving looks, whether it's really nice compliments, whether it's promises about, oh, I should take you to this great party with these movers and shakers. They'd love you. Mm -hmm. it, whether it's something like that about the future, he's going to reward you every time you comply. And every time you put your boundaries up, He's going to punish you. He's going to start looking at other women. He's, his nonverbal behavior will become more distant. He will just, he'll detach. He won't make promises. Or if he said we should do something, you bring it up again in your life. He'll be like, well, let me double check to make sure that'll be okay with those people. Mm -hmm. So this happens from the start. By the time you consciously notice it without my help, by the time you consciously notice it, you're probably pretty well trained by this guy. Yeah. Not because you're stupid, but because you have a human brain and this is how the brain has been, been designed. It is your our brains are designed to take in information and adapt quickly. That's how it's designed. Mm -hmm. And whether they're educated or not, or just cunning, abusers have figured that out. And they will use what they know to take advantage of you. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how subtle it is. And then something mm -hmm. else that stood out to me, um, I believe I read this in your book. You were saying that they kind of study how to be a leader. So they'll read books on leadership and how to influence people. And that's something that I would find attractive, honestly, because I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, this person's trying to get their life together, <laughs> do better in their career or something like that. And, you know, it's easy to see how they can use those. Like I can remember books that my ex was reading, you know, and just how he used the things that he learned in that book on me as well. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, and here's a, a problem. Abusers have always come at all intellectual levels. Mm -hmm. I've had, when I've done training, I was actually hired by a, a small city in Australia to train in my workshops everyone who worked for the city in any capacity. The mayor, a, they had a female mayor who came twice, okay? But so I had everything from crossing guards to preschool teachers to... Uh, executives and social, you know, the people working in the social work space, mm -hmm. everybody came at different times. And it was really jarring to talk to the preschool teachers who, when I, after we went through the tactics, said, oh my God, we're seeing a lot of these in our preschool kids who come from abusive homes. Wow. Yeah. So these guys learn how to manipulate early. What I'm talking about, again, requires cunning. It does not require genius. So he doesn't have to be super smart. And one of the things that's available now, too, even if you're not somebody that reads a lot, these courses on, you know, getting to yes and, all, and the books, the courses, all of them are available in YouTube videos, seminar, online seminars, they're available in audio books. And having something you read reinforced by something you hear makes it extra strong. So one mm -hmm. of the things I recommend to people, including you, Jazzy, you've read my book and you know my book, the book isn't very long. I made it mm -hmm. that way so you could get through it quickly. I wanted to give you the core information. 
But what I also did and what was released in July, and you'll find it on my website, you'll find the audio version of my book that I just released. And I feel like I was pretty clever with this because Jazzy knows this from reading the book. I wrote the book in two voices. Mm -hmm. The left-hand page is in the voice of an abuser as he tells other men, this is how you train your woman. And what is there is very realistic. It's an amalgam, a combination of what these men told me in our confidential sessions. Mm -hmm. Now, I still can never reveal anything that could identify a specific abuser, but there's no law that says I couldn't combine their traits and the way they, they looked at their, at their target, at, at their victims, at their prey. There's nothing that said I couldn't combine it and make that information available. So that's what I did. So I have the voice of a male abuser on the left-hand page. On the right-hand page, it's in my voice. As I explained, this is what it looks like. This is, this is why it works. So what I did was, again, because the angry, nasty, sinister abuser, you don't need my help to identify those guys. Mm -hmm. But the other two types, you may. They can be suave and charming and successful, and you just wouldn't look at them and know that how abusive they were. Right. So I actually got an actor. I was unpacking in my house here in Brisbane, and I streamed one of my favorite shows, which is a British TV show called Foil's War. And it was available on PBS. It was actually very popular in the States, too. Um, and I'm unpacking just listening to it because I've watched it so many times. I know what scene it is just from listening. Mm -hmm. And one of the main one of the three main characters started speaking. And I stopped and looked up and I said, I wonder if he can flatten his British accent a little bit so Americans could understand it. Because I can, he, he speaks very clearly. If you watch Downton Abbey, you, you can understand a British accent. He's not Cockney. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they have to flatten it just a little so that the average American won't have difficulty. I said, I wonder if he can do that. So I looked him up online, found his management. He has a female manager, thank God. <laughs> I told her what I was doing. And she talked him into doing it. So you'll notice when you listen to the male abuser, he has the most amazing, sexy voice. And the reason I did that is because I wanted you to be aware he is not going to necessarily be that angry, scowling guy. Mm -hmm. He could be a guy with a smooth, suave voice, you know, sounds like radio, you know, somebody that sounds like Barry White or something, <laughs> you know, ha knows all the right things to say. Mm -hmm. But I, the poor guy, he's I've watched his work for years because, of course, I work in the UK, too. So I've watched his work for years. Um, we met via Zoom before he recorded and I was totally fangirling. Although he won't find out unless he listens to this podcast because <laughs> I was acting all cool. Like I didn't know, you know, Yeah. but he's, he's a Shakespearean trained actor. So he's a brilliant actor. And I think I traumatized him. <laughs> so, because he's like, do guys really think like this? Do right. they really act like this? And yeah. I was like, well, well, he's been married for a long time. Now I know why. Um, I'm like, it's a good thing that you don't know that this is true, but I right. promise you it is. Mm -hmm. The way they think about their partners and their targets, I call them targets. When they're going after you, you're a target. You're their prey. The way they will design how they'll do that is so sinister and devious. I would be sitting there doing, you know, the professional nod. All of you professional women, you know the nod. When somebody tells you something totally shocking, you've been trained to just have a non-judgmental face and you just nod. Inside, I was going, oh my God, I'd have yeah. goosebumps on my arms. So you need to know how these guys think. But as much as that, you need to know how you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I want to ask you, too, about remorse and whether or not they felt anything when they're telling you this. Do they really, really get, like, the impact of the things that they've done and say? I just, like, is there any remorse at all? 
Um, if he is actually an abuser, I'm not talking about a guy who came from a family where he has a few bad traits mm -hmm. who wants to get better. I'm not talking about those. The actual abusers have no remorse, none whatsoever. They see this, their behavior as protecting their own interests. Yeah. So they have no remorse. And in my new book, I released a, uh, another book in July as well. July was a busy month for me. <laughs> Congratulations. So last, <laughs> thank you. So in July 2023, I released another book called Fascination with the Devil, Why Women Love Emotionally Dangerous Men. And I don't only talk about abusers. I talk about cheaters. I talk about commitment phobic men. I talk about men, the kind of men that come in and try to sweep you off their feet, off your feet and then mm -hmm. disappear. I talk about rebels, the kind of guy you get involved with because there's a part of you that wants to shock your parents or, <laughs> you know, shock mm -hmm. your friends. I talk about those and I do talk about abusers, but I call them hostile victims because they always feel sorry for themselves. <laughs> yeah. But I show you what each of these guys look like, but there's a whole chapter called a silk purse from a sow's ear where I discuss in depth, will he change? He's told me he'll change. Can I believe him? And in that short chapter, I describe what someone does, says, and how they behave when they sincerely want to transform themselves so that you can do a mental checklist to see if he is genuinely willing to change, if he's putting the effort into change, or in more than nine times out of 10, if he's just using it as a gesture to keep you from leaving or to get you to come back. Mm -hmm. So you need to know that because I do believe people can change. And in fact, in Fascination with the Devil, the last chapter is called Ending the Fascination. So the whole book is about teaching women to fundamentally change your taste in men because it doesn't help for me to teach you how to attract a really good man if you're not really attracted to that type. If mm -hmm. you're still wanting the bad boy, if you're still wanting the guy that's promiscuous and that you have to worry about him cheating, if you've gotten into what they call in social psychology, a fixed action pattern, where you have a way of doing things that as soon as you get a stimulus, as soon as you get attracted to somebody, you go into a way of behaving that keeps leading you into trouble again and again and again. Mm -hmm. That's called a fixed action pattern. I show you how to alter that, how to put a new direction into your, into your heart, not just your mind, into your heart. So you actually desire a man who will cherish you and love you back, a man you can trust. Yeah, I love that. I'll definitely have to check that one out. So I know you mentioned that jealousy is one of the main traits of men that are abusers. And I also know, especially from experience, that control is something that these men really want to have over their victim. Is there such thing as a healthy amount of control or manipulation in a relationship? And how can people tell when it crosses the line to become more abusive? Well, what it is, is women accept control from a man because they mistake it for protection. And in fact, w one of the, the warning signs, one of the tactics that I describe and that you'll find, your audience will find if they contact me on my website, I will be happy to send you a free copy of the document. The mm -hmm. organization that had me write it already paid for it. <laughs> so I'm, So I make it available to anyone who contacts me, I make it available through my podcast and I make it available through my website. Just email me and I will send you a copy of this document mm -hmm. and it has the setup. It has the selection process and some of the tricks they use and it has all of the tactics. And one of the tactics, an important one, is called misattribution. And what that means is putting a positive name on a negative behavior. So they call their control protection or taking care of you mm -hmm. 
so that you will accept what they're doing, but it's not, it's not protection, it's control. And you really can tell the difference. Somebody that is protective will say, well, I know you're working really late and it's dark and there's been some dodgy stuff going on near your office. Um, I'm going to come pick you up after work instead of you just, you know, taking public transport or driving or whatever. Mm -hmm. It makes me nervous. I'd rather, I'd rather know that you're safe. That's protection. Telling you, you're not allowed to take public transport. I have to take you everywhere you want to go. You should give up your car. I can drive you. I don't mind taking you. That's part of my role as your man. That's control. Also, a way to tell the difference in any of it is a really important word that only has two letters. No. <laughs> From the beginning to the end, if he suggests something and you tell him no, look closely to see how he responds. Now, when he's still trying to lure you in, he'll probably catch himself after he reacts. But if you watch him, you'll see that flash of rage on his face before he gets it under control. Because this guy believes his partner is his possession, is a thing that does not have the right to say no. Hmm. Another warning sign, look for how quickly they try to move. Abusers are very uncomfortable in relationships where their target, because you're still a target if you're not their victim yet, where their target still has the ability to walk away. So they try to get their, their target locked into that relationship as quickly as possible. So look at speed. How quickly does he try to get you to make future plans with him? How quickly does he start calling you his girlfriend or his future wife? Mm -hmm. How quickly does he propose or ask you to live with him? All of this shows up super early. Saying things like, oh, we'd have beautiful kids. Oh, if you and I were married, we'd live in this great neighborhood. Does he talk about the future too much and he's still a stranger to you? This is all going to be happening within mm -hmm. the first six weeks of getting to know this guy. Wow. But be careful for misattribution. Mm -hmm. Misdirection is also, I, have, I call them les mis, <laughs> because there are two of them. There's misdirection, where you start noticing the warning signs, so he distracts you by turning your attention away to look over there. So he makes you a huge promise, he buys you an expensive gift, he takes you unexpectedly away for our lavish weekend. He gets down on one knee and proposes. So he's going to do whatever he can to keep you from really tracking those warning signs that he cannot help but, but demonstrate. Mm -hmm. So that's one mis misdirection. Misattribution is the other. Yeah. For every negative thing he does, he will have a very well scripted and smooth explanation for why it's not really a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to be too smart to buy it. Yeah. And something else that you mentioned in your book too, is that their, their goal is to make you as insecure as possible. So absolutely, how can you tell, I'm sure this is somewhat obvious, but it happens. People don't realize. So how can you tell that someone is doing this to you? Well, first of all, when you meet someone, if they ask you questions where, let's say some, a guy is getting you through having an advantage and he meets you and you have a job that doesn't require a college degree and he knows that. And he asks you questions like, so why didn't you go to college? Or whatever. And he's like, oh, I think college is important, you know. When I went to Harvard for, you know, undergrad and graduate school and medical school, I found that I learned so very much. So he's, he's emphasizing that advantage that he's got over you. Mm -hmm. Any little mistake you make, another, another tactic, any little mistake you make, he draws attention to it. Yeah. 
you mispronounce a word, um, you don't know where something is, and they're like, you don't know where that is? Oh, okay, I thought everybody knew that. <laughs> so you start to feel like, ooh, am I really that dumb? He looks at you and any place that you're self-conscious, he tries to find anything you're self-conscious about, and very few women aren't self-conscious about something, especially physically, because we have a whole, a whole industry that profits from telling us that what we are naturally isn't enough. So most of us are pretty insecure about something and he will try to figure out what that is. Mm -hmm. He will either compliment you about it or make a, a, com a little comment about it. And he will watch you closely like you should be watching him. He will watch you closely to see if it hit. Yeah. So saying, oh, I thought your, your, your hair or, you know, he'll just talk about something. He'll mm -hmm. talk about various things during the conversation. Um, another way, comparing you to an ex. He finds out you're self-conscious about something. Let's say that you have short natural hair. And I'm so glad that movement of, of pride in your appearance has gotten stronger. Let's say, mm -hmm. but let's say you're self-conscious about it. And he's talking about his ex-girlfriend and how she had hair down to her backside and how much he loved playing with her hair. So that's a, an, a sneaky way. It's a veiled, mm -hmm. aggressive way to make you self-conscious and it works. Mm -hmm. So anything that you don't have, he on one hand will tell you, I'm so glad you're young and not jaded and hard like these other women. But then he'll brag about how much expertise and how many degrees and how much, you know, how long so-and-so has been at the top of the chain. And it's another woman that he's comparing you against mm -hmm. who has all of these advantages that actually it's not about intellect. It takes time. Yeah. So if you pay attention, it's easy, pretty easy to figure out where someone feel good about themselves and where they feel self-conscious. Mm -hmm. And he'll do both, by the way. He won't just try to make you self feel self-conscious. He'll also pay attention to how you want to look, what you want to feel good about. So let's say you, you're you somebody who really pays attention and you do beautiful makeup and you, you meet with him and you look great. He'll keep talking about, oh, I love the way you do, do your makeup. <laughs> you know, it's... It's so, it's flattering, but it's not thick, it's natural, and, and he'll be customizing it. So he won't yeah. just say, oh, that's you look great. He'll talk specifically about something you spent time on. Mm -hmm. And you, you'll be feeling all good about it. Yeah. And then a little bit later, he'll pick on something else. He'll talk about something else. So while on one hand, he's making you feel great, on the other hand, He's making you feel very self-conscious. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that's the hardest part because you keep going back and forth. You're like, wait, he's so nice to me sometimes. And then he's mean to me other times. And it's so confusing. But the problem is the human brain. The mm -hmm. problem is when, when, when you get what they call intermittent reward. So it's an unexpected reward and you can't tell when it's coming that actually will bond you to someone more than if they are, you know, just moderately nice the whole time. Wow. Yeah. So you have to watch out for the brain processes and you have to put a circuit breaker in there. Like I talked about with the fixed action pattern, you have mm -hmm. to put a circuit breaker in there. You have to understand my brain loves intensity. And if I, if this guy's offering me intensity, there's a part of me that's going to be drawn to that. But I don't want intensity that includes destruction. I don't want the kind of intensity where I can't trust him. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be smart about this. And I'm going to get away from him before I get attached to him. Because it's only going to get worse. And the negative side is going to grow the more yeah. time I spend with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. That's, <laughs> that's really fascinating. I know I keep throwing all these questions at you, so I'm going to give you one more. <laughs> Gaslighting. Yeah, Gaslighting. Can you talk about 
what it is for anyone who doesn't know, but also like why this is such an effective strategy and tactic for abusers to use? Well, the term gaslighting is based on a movie from the 1930s called Gaslighting, where a man had a, married a wealthy woman and he wanted to get control of her estate. So he convinced her that she was insane. That was his goal. He tried to convince her she was insane. So gaslighting in, with regard to abusers means convincing you that something didn't happen the way you remember. It can be a positive thing that happened. You guys did something wonderful together. You mentioned, oh, that weekend we went to Colorado was fantastic. What are you talking about? We never went to Colorado. <laughs> Often, though, what will be gaslit is something he did that was terrible. Mm -hmm. So just like that old song, it wasn't me, they <laughs> yeah. will actually try to convince you, no, I never did that. I wouldn't do something like that. And they'll make it sound so convincing. And there's multi stages to it. They'll first try to deny it, say, it, oh, that didn't happen. They'll try to pretend it happened in your past. And you're just kind of having a, a little mental breakdown and bringing that forward. Mm-hmm. They may even try to convince you it was you that did it to them. Yeah. So basically gaslighting is changing your perception or attempting to change your perception of what occurred so that it benefits them and harms you. And some of them are very, very good at it. I remember a female abuser I was housemates with. And why do I bring this up? Because usually when I do TV, I get the what about calling and saying, well, what about abusive women? Yeah. Um, this woman was abusive and not just with the men, but also with her friends. I was her housemate. And I think I lived with her a bit longer because she couldn't really do anything to hurt me. And I was getting great research off this woman. <laughs> we, we, we actually had, she brought a friend over and we had a nice dinner and we were talking, and she didn't like the fact that the woman was asking me questions, and it took attention away from her. Mm. So she just said something really mean and rude out of the blue. And I handled it at the time, because I don't believe in making a scene when there are other people there. The next day, I said, I really didn't appreciate you saying that. She's like, I didn't say that. I said, yes, you did. She said this, and you said that. No, I would never say something like that. You must be remembering somebody else that said something like that. And then she comes back several days later because, of course, abusers never let anything go. Mm. She comes back several days later and said, I talked to my dad, and he agrees that I would never say something like that. <laughs> and wow. I thought, ooh, this is interesting. I Note to self, gaslighting. <laughs> this is a... So, yes, I was taking notes on how it was done, but this is what they mm -hmm. will do. And often they will convince you that they were the one hurt by the interaction, even if it was something terrible that they did. Yeah. So you end up comforting them. Mm -hmm. What is scary is that you have to have specific knowledge to protect yourself. As I mentioned, I worked in domestic violence in both in the United States and Australia for years. And every program I came across, no matter how many awards they had on the walls, was all teaching the same thing, and it wasn't keeping women safe. I know about these things because I study something very specific, social psychology, that looks at how people are influenced, persuaded, manipulated, coerced, indoctrinated, brainwashed. Mm -hmm. That is specific knowledge. So the fact that you didn't know this for the audience, if you didn't know this already, or you knew it a little, but couldn't put your real finger on it, get the whole list of information. Because working around the world, I was only able to find 25 tactics, and that includes the honorable mentions, like gaslighting, mm -hmm. and like another tactic called flying monkeys. <laughs> now, now you have to explain that one. <laughs> Flying monkeys is an interesting tactic. That's part of the honorable mentions. It's not used quite as often as the main body of tactics. But flying monkeys is using other people to attack the victim. Mm. So it's linked with allies. So what I talk about in 
my work is that often when you get involved with the charming type of abuser or even the the over controlled abuser who's really cunning and devious they will work hard to make allies of your loved ones your workmates whatever they will do things for them they'll say things for them they'll be there for them they'll be so charming and they're doing it so that they gain credibility so that when you come back later and tell these people what he's up to you will not be believed mm. and it's often combined with flying monkeys where they will get these people alone especially once they've done something for them and say you know you're so nice i just wanted to mention something she's doing i'm having a bit of trouble can you give me some advice she's doing x y and z mhm mm and what he's mentioning is actually stuff he's gotten up to but he's blaming it on you and that's a flying monkey where he's undermining you in a very fundamental way he's not just making a, an ally of them Mm -hmm. but he's undermining you behind your back so that he will be able to use other people to attack you yeah if you ever try to hold him accountable wow these tactics man <laughs> i'm i but they're so, so universal yeah i'm so glad that you did this research and that you're sharing all of this because when you're in the situation you don't really see it obviously and now you know being out of it i'm looking back and i'm like wow this stuff is so obvious <laughs> at the same time i don't have a name to put to it but yeah hearing you describe all of these things i'm like yep yep that's exactly what happens that's exactly what happens so i'm glad that you're sharing this because i know it's going to help so many people well one of the things i do also and one of the things i'm going to be doing with online classes on my website i'm going to take fascination with the devil even further So I mentioned that the final chapter is called Ending the Fascination. So I really talk about all the way through though. I talk about what you can do. It's not just about him. It's about you. How can you change your taste fundamentally? And I'm going to take that even further with online classes that I'm going to make available on my website. So we're going to have online classes. We're going to go through what you need to do, but one of the classes is going to be on how to differentiate between a charming bad guy and a genuine good guy. Uh, yes, definitely need that. Once you know, well first of all, let me give you a hint. I'll give one away for free because the <laughs> courses are not going to be expensive. We're talking mm -hmm. about like the cost of going to the movie and getting a popcorn. I want the information right. out there. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I do have to pay a mortgage. So I yeah, really you did. deserve to be compensated for this work, for sure. And it takes, you know, my the people I pay bills to don't accept <laughs> the fact that I do good work for the community. They actually want to get paid, but uh, I won't charge very much because I want to make it available no matter who you are. We'll talk mm -hmm. about how you can differentiate a good guy from a bad guy and one of the ways early on is when he wants to move seats or he wants you to try something Um you smile and tell him I'll try that next time but I've really been looking forward to this dish that they have because it's too hard to make at home I only get it when I go to restaurants. So you in some way find a way to tell him no and when you do watch him. If he's a good guy that really likes you there will be no problem. If he's an abuser trying to control you he'll flash disapproval he'll flash anger and then you'll see him breathe through it because he doesn't want you to see how easily he's enraged so that's something you can tell from the very beginning but we'll go through and it will be easy you will easily be able to differentiate a guy who has issues he's trying to hide from you and a really good guy who's the kind you should hold close now i want people to contact me because right now I am actively seeking to prioritize what my online classes should be and I'm asking my podcast audience I'm asking your podcast audience I'm asking people mm -hmm. who buy copies of my book to contact me on my website so the website is www.drdinamcmillan.drdinamcmi L L A N all one word all small dot com. So just contact and you can just if you put Dr. Dina 
on Google, it'll spell my whole name in case you didn't get the spelling. And it'll show you my website. Go on my website. There's a place where it says contact me. And I want you to contact me and tell me what sort of online courses you'd like me to do. These will be one to two hours. They'll be very inexpensive. And I have every intention of giving you the benefits of my extremely overpriced education <laughs> and all the research that I've done. And I especially want to teach women the difference between an abu a charming abuser or a charming um, intense burnout. Because one of the types I talk about in my new book, Fascination with the Devil, I talk about a type called an intense burnout who wants to come in and sweep you off your feet because these are the kinds of guys who want only that first initial phase where all the hormones are raging when you first fall in love with someone. Mm -hmm. So as soon as their bodies start to adapt, as soon as the love goes into a new phase, they're gone with no notice and you never see them again. So those types also will be extremely charming and extremely effusive and, and complimentary when you first meet them. But so will a guy who's had a crush on you for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you specifically how to tell the difference between a great guy who just really appreciates and likes you and someone who's using certain behaviors as a con. I don't want you to get conned. And one of the first ways, a first, the initial screening with the abusers, it won't necessarily help you with the intense burnout, but it will help you with the abuser, is when he suggests something, be nice about it, but tell him no. He wants to move seats. You say, you know what, I really like it here. He puts off, he's late twice, so he's made the appointment for you guys to get together. He says something's happened, I'll be 10 minutes late. It's a half hour later. He still hasn't shown up. You send him a text and you say, look, I had something that I have to do afterwards. Let's, let's get together another time. Mm -hmm. So you tell him, no, you put up a boundary and see how he behaves because abusers do not want you to have any boundaries. He asks you for intimate, intimate information and you don't tell him. You say, look, I'm not, I don't know you, maybe when we've been together for a while or jokingly tell him, okay, I'll tell you that after we're married <laughs> or I'll yeah. tell you that after I know, I've known you for a while. I'm mm -hmm. just not comfortable sharing that yet. Another tactic that abusers use is I call marathoning where they try to make every interaction last as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So if you go out with them at night, they don't want you to go home. They try to talk you out of going home. They contact you on the way home. They want to chat to two or three o'clock in the morning. Now they do it for two reasons. One, because they're very intense. That's just how they are. They fixate. But also they probably read up on controlling methods. And when we have really long contact with somebody, it builds something called artificial intimacy where we feel like we've known them for a long time and that we know them well. Mm. So they can often get you to admit something. They can ask you an intimate question and you'll tell them the answer at 3 a.m. when you wouldn't if, you, if they'd asked you earlier. Yeah. Or they'll get you to commit to something. Oh, you know, I'm going to the Bahamas in, in you know three months. Do you want to come along? And... You've been talking to this guy for six hours. You feel like you know him. You're like, yeah, I'll come along. But he's going to really hold that, hold you to that. And you've also built up future orientation with him. You've started building a future with this guy, which is dangerous. You don't know him yet. Hmm. So keep your boundaries. Keep the time limited that you interact with him. Um, don't change plans to be with him. If he tries to give you any kind of technology, don't accept it. And hmm. that sounds bizarre, but yeah, especially these um, days, this day and age. Well, even before this day and age, I mean, ten up to ten years ago, they started building stalker apps. Hmm. Now you don't even need that. I know with iPhones, you can you can kiss an iPhone, and they will share information with each other. 
-hmm. He will try to give you something where he can keep track of what you're up to. Don't let him do it. Don't let him change the ringtone on your phone. So there are things you can do. Don't always answer if you're busy. There are things that a regular guy who just likes you will accept and an abuser won't. Keep your boundaries. Don't be ridiculous. You know, oh, it's yeah. one minute after the time I've given to you, so we have to... Don't be silly. <laughs> but have firm boundaries that you maintain and don't let him just take advantage of you because, as I said, the testing and the training, remember, it's not just him training you. You're training your own subconscious mind with regard to this man. Yeah. So if he becomes a recognized authority in your own mind, you'll find yourself complying to what he tells you, and you won't realize when you gave him your permission. Mm -hmm. And a good guy just won't ask. A right. good, he won't even try. He'll be too insecure because he likes you too much. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a really good tip. So we'll wrap it up with this one question I have. Um, first, I want to mention there was a quote from your book that really stood out to me and I saved it. So I'm going to read it and then I have a question after that. So it was once you know you're not going back, your brain can remove the mental anesthesia that allowed you to endure living with him. Oh, that hit so hard. <laughs> It's like, wow, mental anesthesia. Wow. Um, so what would you say to the women that are listening to this episode? And they might be feeling bad and maybe feeling a little bit down because they realize that they kind of let someone manipulate them, take advantage of them in some way. And they kind of miss these signs and maybe they feel a little bad about that. What would you say to those women? Because I know now, especially after reading your book and listening to your podcast, like it wasn't my fault you know, this is all about what he was dealing with. And, you know, now I know the signs to look out for. But yeah, what would you say to those those people? Well, first of all, fascination with the devil is a bit different, because I, in that I actually talk about my own experience falling in love with a guy who was not worthy of any of my attention. So why do you think I write this stuff so well? I've been there, I've done that, and I certainly got the t-shirt. <laughs> so there's no judgment in anything I do. So for all of you, don't feel bad. Mm -hmm. We have been, one of the things I also explain in Fascination, and I also talk about it in my podcast, how the cultural norms that we've been brought up with actually don't just prepare us for this. They actually promote this. Yeah. They promote a vulnerability. They promote bad taste. They promote not protecting yourself. So if you have been conditioned a certain way and it worked on you, welcome to humanity. It worked on most of us. I'm just using what I've learned to help get, get us out of that, that chasm, to help us climb out into the light where we can have healthy relationships, where we can be, we can love ourselves and be with someone who loves us be with a man we respect and love and desire. Mm -hmm. But we have to make a conscious decision to do it because our broader culture will not do it for us. So with regard to the mental anesthesia, that's more of what I talk about with regard to the brain. Our brain will do anything to keep us functioning. So when we're in a terrible situation, and we feel we can't get out of it, our brain will adapt to it. It will soften the impact of the pain we feel. It will, it will actually, it's like wrapping everything up in cotton wool mm. so that we can withstand it and keep going. Mm -hmm. But once we know we're going to be free, it takes the cotton wool off because feeling everything the way, the way you really would feel normally will motivate you to keep going and to not go back. Yeah. What is really important is that once you recognize that a relationship is unhealthy, once you recognize, like I said in Fascination, I show you exactly what people who are going to, from the studies of people who have fundamentally changed themselves, we find out what it takes to do that. 
If you love someone who's been really bad for you and he says he's going to change, find out whether it's he's telling you the truth or not. And believe me, and by the way, he could be lying to himself as well. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't matter. If he's not fundamentally going to change, your life is not going to get better. So you have a choice to make. And I want you to make better choices. I want to get lots of invites to weddings. <laughs> And speaking thereof, part of what I'll be teaching in the course on how to have better taste is how to get a man to commit. Because I, I have a really good record on teaching people how to do that. And it's not complicated, but it is quite specific. Mm -hmm. So once you have a good relationship with a good man, how do you get him to take that extra step and want to make you his wife? Um, our culture says you're supposed to just tell yourself that living together is as good as being married or being engaged is as good as being married, and it's just not true. Mm -hmm. So I help you get there. So as I said, contact me. <laughs> I, I want to know what you think. I want to help as many yeah. people as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Wow. Well, this has been so helpful. I know that this is going to touch a lot of people um, and just you know, obviously bring awareness to this topic. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing and how open you are to having conversations with people. You just said, you know, reach out, which is great. And, you know, you're kind of pivoting your content, the courses that you're creating based on the feedback that you get from your listeners, which is really cool. So people definitely take advantage of her and send her a message. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. So I'll make sure that your website is linked in the show notes. Is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap up? Keep hope. I know a lot of really happy couples. So even if you've been with a bad man for years, you can heal and you can move on. The, the, the only Some people feel the only solution is being single for the rest of their lives. I'm here to tell you that's not true. There are good men out there and your good man is actually looking for you. Mm -hmm. I love that. So inspiring. Thank you so much again. And thank you. We'll talk again. Thanks for tuning in to the First Hustle Then Brunch podcast. If you enjoyed this episode or learned something new, I'd love if you subscribed and left us a review. Another way to support the podcast is to take a screenshot of this episode and share it on your Instagram story. Tag me at First Hustle Then Brunch so I can repost it. Thank you so much for supporting the show, and I'll see you in the next episode.